I'll do a, just a quick intro of our panelists and then we'll get conversation going. So we have Angela Amos, class of 2001, uh, is the former Senior Policy Advisor, Office of Energy Market Regulation, West Division at the Federal Energy Regula Regulatory Commission. And she is set to take on a new role at an energy tech company, which we'll get to hear about. We have Ann Ford, class of 1972, is a partner at DLA Piper Law Firm, where she is the US Chair and Global Co-Chair Clients and Sectors. She has been repeatedly recognized as one of America's leading lawyers for intellectual property. And Lily Roberts, class of 2008, is the Managing Director of the Economic Policy Team at the Center for American Progress, a progressive policy think tank in DC. So just to get us started, Anne, I'll throw the first question to you and then we'll rotate and hear about this. Um, we just like to tell us about the path you've taken since you were a student at HB and what you're doing now. Okay, well, I'm gonna abbreviate it because my path's a lot longer than theirs. Um, so in a nutshell, um, after HB, I, uh, I made the decision, which I think was actually kind of a fateful decision to go to Georgetown University. I was the first person at HB to go to Georgetown and uh, it was kind of a surprise, I think, when the um, when the it was it was one of the first years they were letting women go there. I think it was I think it's sixty eight is when it went co-ed. A lot of schools, I know it's hard to believe, but they were all male institutions, and Georgetown was one of them. Um, but I decided to go to Georgetown because I kind of fell in love with the Washington, um, and I was also sort of a political junkie. I'd worked on a couple of political campaigns, even in as a as a high schooler. So. Uh, was interested in going to DC, uh, was in DC, double majored in political science and English. Uh, I, it was pulled in two different directions. I had the sort of creative interest and I had the sort of political interest, um, took every standardized test in the book after, during college to see if I should go to grad school or law school. And the one thing I thought I would never do is go be a lawyer because I thought pre-law people were just annoying. and. Um, and I just didn't see myself being in law school. I thought it was just obnoxious. So I took the year, I got, actually got into case law school, you know, just to sort of, you know, come up with an idea to keep everybody from bothering me. And I had worked on the Hill and I was back in college and I thought, okay, I'll work on the Hill. I was interested in policy. Uh, and ultimately then I realized, you know what, I just need a year to be completely kind of uh, knock around just uh, so I, I I got a job with the Park Service working at the White House, which is sort of a weird thing, but it got me to be able to sort of be with my friends and and explore the city and not worry about being too serious. And so I did that for a while uh, for that year, and then I I that was a seasonal thing, and I took a long term job at a law firm as a they said, well, do you want to be a paralegal? And I couldn't think of anything more boring than sitting in an office, so I <laughs> I, I was a messenger. Um, which gave me a lot of time to kind of observe. I thought at the time I was going to be an English professor. That was kind of the thing I wanted to be. I'd studied in Ireland and I loved Irish literature. And I thought, okay, I, I want to be an Irish, but that was not meant to be. And actually it was the, that's my first tip is if you get rebuffed, it's probably a good thing, you know, because now the idea of being a, an English Irish literature scholar is not me at all. It's not me. I'm a people person. And I'm a practical person, and that would have just been insane. So um, luckily, I, I did go to grad school. Um, I, I actually started enjoying uh, in this in this um, messenger job. One of the things I did was file a lot of um, papers at the Supreme Court. And so what, what that allowed me to do was actually sit in on arguments before it became a thing. You know, there were no lines. You could just go in there and watch arguments in the Supreme Court and watch arguments in the Court of Appeals, which I thought were just like theater. I just thought it was so interesting. And I love the sort of collaboration that went into, you know, when I could see it back in my law firm, everybody kind of working on a project together. I just thought that collaboration piece was really intriguing. So I thought maybe this is such a bad idea after all. So I decided to go to law school and I did go to law school at Case Law School and I enjoyed it. I believe it or not, I had a blast in law school. I really, I had fun and I got on the law review, but the one thing I, I knew I kind of had to make my own way out of Cleveland. My father was a pretty prominent lawyer. My, my friend, Sarah Patterson's on the line, so she knows he was a prominent lawyer in Washington. I thought I cannot just, I can't do this, you know, do this. So I had to go someplace else and make it on my own. So I, <clears throat> I transferred after my first year at Case down to Duke Law School in North Carolina, and I graduated from Duke Law School. Um, 
loved that. I worked on a, a journal called Law and Contemporary Problems, which is a more policy wonky kind of, uh, it wasn't as legal easy. It was more sort of policy driven. And I did my paper and our issue uh, on um, on sort of media, uh, which has became kind of my focus. I worked at three law firms now, um, and I'll fast forward on them. One was a very small communications boutique where I did, in the beginning, FCC regulatory lawyer, believe it or not, and then I switched to intellectual property. And then the second one, I after a bunch of years at this little boutique, I really moved away from communication, became a IP lawyer at Baker and Hotzeller's Washington office, picked me up, and I was there for a bunch of years, and then got recruited to where I am currently, where I've been for 20 years, which is a, a large uh, international law firm uh, called DLA Piper. And so here, um, I was able to do sort of brand intellectual property work. I'm not a scientist, so I didn't do patent work. I did copyright and trademark, which is protection of artistic works and also protection of brand names for companies and with their marketing departments for big brands as well as emerging company brands. Um, and then sort of pivoted there to do more sort of management side. And I ran the intellectual property technology group, uh, which was a fairly significant operation um, here. And then just dropped that after many years, uh, moved on to my final resting place, which is I'm uh, hopefully not the final, final resting place, but I'm on the global board of this organization, which is a $3 billion law firm. Uh, basically, it's got 4,200. It's like the largest. If it's not the largest, it's one of the largest law firms in the world. So it's it's that that to me is is that's where I really kind of was interested in is sort of seeing the, the entire operation and not just my little piece of it uh, and be more involved on the global side. Um, uh, with my colleagues around the world. Great. So that's that's my quick and dirty life <laughs> up to this point. I have a personal life too. I have two daughters uh, and a husband. I, I'm married to a psychologist, thank the Lord, um, who's who's the secret to my success. And my two amazing daughters, um, both of whom are big uh, English majors. We're all four English majors. You know, everybody's an English major in this house. And uh, even though one daughter just graduated from Columbia, a uh, uh, MSW program, and the other one is in advertising. So, um, so anyway, so they, it's a it's a it's a good group. One daughter's in New York, and the other one's here in uh, Maryland. Great, thank you. I mean, and I'll, before I throw that same question to Angela, I just wanted to say, like, hearing. The stories like that are just really invaluable to our students and I'm sure to our alum. Um, you know, Fran mentioned and Dana, this fellowship program. And one thing that we emphasize to the students is like you, you may be pursuing a fellowship in science research, business and finance or writing, but we're, we don't expect or want you to be thinking like I'm setting my path forward in life now. It's just like you're learning skills, you're developing a growth mindset and who knows where that might take you. So it's really good to hear those kinds of stories. So. Angela, how about you? If I throw the same question to you, tell us about your journey since HB. All right. So after HB, I went to Harvard. And unlike Anne, I thought, I really, I might want to be an attorney. It could be cool. So I thought I'd start off um, studying government. But freshman year, like freshman fall, I took a seminar, like a history class of Afro-American Afro studies taught by Cornell West. And it was amazing. And I was like, this is so interesting to study history and all these things. And so based on that class, I changed my focus, my concentration to be government plus Afro-American studies. So I studied that at Harvard, but many students at the time still ended up working for consulting firms or investment banks. And I was no different. So after graduating, I worked at an investment bank um, because due to the excellent HB education, I'm good at math. Um, so I'm like good at math and science and um, finance type jobs allow people who are good at math to succeed. So I started off um, fresh or not freshman, like the first week of that analyst program. This was at Lehman Brothers, but before Lehman fell apart. Um, they made this announcement saying like, hey, we're thinking of starting this energy trading group. If anyone's interested, let us know. And so of course everyone was interested. Um, and I ended up being one of the first five people hired to start a brand new energy trading group from scratch. So it was five analysts and two senior people. 
um, tasked with building an energy business. So the investment banking division already had a pretty robust platform providing services to utilities and stuff like that, but they had to go to other companies to do the hedges and to make the markets themselves do the buying and the selling. So the point of this energy trading group was to help the investment banking division keep more of the business in house. So after a few years of um, trading electricity and natural gas as part of this um, team, I realized like, okay, it's great to, you know, just buy and sell and make markets for people, but I really like energy and I'd like to learn more. And to do that, I want to work at a place that actually has steel in the ground. So I left Lehman in summer of 2008 to join an independent power producer called Mirant based out of Atlanta. Um, it was really funny because a lot of us at Lehman at the time continue to like, you know, bleed Lehman green and still have a lot of love and affection for the firm. Um, so when I left, like if you, like if one digs into the archives um, of like my Facebook profile or something, you might see a post from someone being like, Angela, you left us and the bank's falling apart, but don't worry, we're holding things together. It'll be fine. Um, and of course it, it wasn't fine, but I was gone by then. So, you know, um, but, so I worked at Mirant, um, managing my dog's just walking by now, uh, managing a desk. Uh, we call it the real-time desk. We own power plants, as I said. So I was responsible for a team that actually dispatched a bunch of the power plants in our fleet. Um, and I also still did the trading part because it was fun. And also because when you actually own power plants, you have to be responsible about the risk. So the trading activity that I did and that my team did was to make sure that we had an additional revenue stream in addition to the you know, production of electricity to be used by consumers. Mm -hmm. um, after a few years, we merged with another energy company called RRI and we formed super, like one of the largest independent power producers in the country called Genon and a bunch of us moved to Houston, um, stayed there. This, I switched my area of focus a little bit. Um, previously, I'd been focusing on everything west of the Rockies geographically, but when we became Genon, I did everything east. And so um, the job was quite similar. Again, thinking about how to operate power plants and make money off of those plants. Um, obviously there's, when you're thinking about commodities, there's an environmental component, there is a regulatory component, um, there's obviously a financial component. So these types of roles, both trading and what we called power plant optimization um, were, as I said before, fun, but also I got a chance to really use a lot of different skill sets because again, you have to be compliant in addition to just um, making money. I also liked that um, when I when I would talk to my like elderly grandmother or others, like everyone sort of knows like, okay, you work for a power company, you keep the lights on. Um, so as complicated as the roles sound, sometimes they're also very practical. And that was interesting to me. Then um, I decided to go to business school because I thought maybe I wanted to pivot. So I went back to Harvard got an MBA when while there concluded like, actually, no, I still really like energy, but maybe I want to fix what's broken. Mm -hmm. So that's what took me to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC. Um, and that is the federal agency that manages the interstate transfer of energy. So that's everything from electricity to hydro projects because you know rivers can cross state lines to pipelines, or at least the financial, the rate part of pipelines um, all kinds of it's any energy that is again crossing a state border, it's in some way under FERC, or at least the financial component or the rate component is under FERC's jurisdiction. So I've been at FERC for the last five and a half years or so, um, in a bunch of different roles, including the one that was announced earlier. Um, but that was all the way through last week. I quit last Friday or quit a couple weeks ago, but you know, my last day was last Friday. Um, and so then this coming week, I'm going to start a new job for a company called Uplight, which is a software company 
that helps utilities to think about their customers' energy usage. Um, as we know, like green energy and clean energy is something that is gaining more and more prominence. Mm -hmm. But we also know that some utilities are faster or slower than others when it comes to actually making that transition from the old school ways of producing power to embracing some of the newer ways to do that. So part of Uplight's mission is to help these utilities manage their energy transition, um, as well as engage with customers in a you know more efficient manner. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, for all the different roles I've had in different energy companies or different you know uh, aspects of the energy complex, I've never actually worked for a tech company. So I'm pretty excited about um, that opportunity in addition to being able to leverage all the skills that I've built up until this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's me. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I guess I also have a personal life, but it's not very exciting. So <laughs> me and my dog here in Arlington, Virginia, living no. the dream. Okay. No offense to the dog is in her and the social life they're giving you. Um, well, that's very exciting. I know like our director of sustainability and a bunch of our students, I'm sure would love to hear more about that. Um, new company. Um, and then I'm hope I, mean, I hope a year from now we get to do these events in person and get together and talk. And then I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about class with Cornell West. I would love to hear more about that. That's pretty exciting. Um, and then so Lily, then I'll throw and Lily, as I was reading your introduction, it just occurred to me, it's been like five years since I posted anything to this account, but you were actually the first person to follow the Writing Center's Twitter account way back in, in 2011. That sounds about right. <laughs> when was the last time the Writing Center tweeted? I, it, it was probably about five years ago. Yeah. That kind of fell by the wayside. And we do have some of our favorite writer friends are in DC, like Clint Smith and Elizabeth Acevedo are there. So we will get that Twitter account back up and going. But tell us about like, so tell us about your journey since high school. Sure. So um, I left HB for uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, where I had a Moorhead Kane scholarship, which was an incredible program. Um, it's like a full ride to cover tuition and fees and everything, but it also um, provides for internships um, and other experiences in during the summers and during the school year um, and was just incredibly transformative for me. Um, I loved, I mean, Carolina was a wonderful, wonderful place to um, go to college. And then, you know, on top of that, the Moorhead um, sort of gave me an enormous amount of freedom to basically try anything that came into my head. Um, you know, I'm a very, uh, I have a lot of interests is sort of a kind way to put it. Um, I dabble in a lot of things. Um, that was certainly true at HB. I did everything from um, science research at NASA to musical theater to the high school newspaper and the writing center, uh, which is probably why I followed you on Twitter those years ago, um, but have never really wanted to commit to one discipline. So um, the more had really allowed me to explore my interests sort of scot-free, um, you know, not having to worry about uh, sort of the paying of college, which was a wonderful um, blessing to have. So I, uh, double majored in English and another English major on the call and um, Peace, War and Defense, which is an interdisciplinary approach to military history, um, which I was not uh, particularly interested in military history, but um, I, it allowed me to take ethics classes and international relations classes and history classes and all sorts of things. Um, I took um, like a war in Shakespeare class, all sort of under this umbrella of um, understanding conflict uh, as a period of social change. Um, and while I was at Carolina, I um, got very involved in student government, um, as well as an undergraduate public policy think tank, which is exactly as cool as it sounds, um, but really set me up to learn to love the pu public policy world um, I've always been deeply interested in social justice and politics. Um, I wasn't sort of in the activism side of things as much. Um, I was approaching it from a much wonkier place, um, which has borne out since then as well. Um, after college, I came to DC for an internship uh, in the Obama White House during the first term 
Um, and from there, uh, started working in policy research. So I had done um, science research and a lot of math and science at HB and in college, and um, was super passionate about evaluation work. So determining whether a policy is working the way it's intended to work, is it reaching the people it's intended to reach, um, how much is it costing per person or per output or per Medicaid user or whatever the sort of unit of measurement is. Um, so I worked at a company called Mathematica Policy Research, which is a really wonderful um, research. Oh, my dog is here. Sorry, we got to have a little pause for a dog. Um, so I worked at Mathematica for um, five, six years. And during that time, um, really focused in on anti-poverty research. So I was working on government contracts mostly. Um, so for example, the administration for children and families within HHS in the federal government would say, we want to hire some Mathematica researchers to tell us what the sort of new frontiers are in delivering anti-poverty services to families. Um, you know, what are some programs across the country that are doing particularly well? What are some new strategies that they're pursuing? Are there you know, ways that federal funding could expand those programs reach? Um, so I would work on, on research projects like that. It was great. It was like being in grad school, but getting paid for it. I was doing all sorts of really wonderful anti-poverty research. Um, and I was also able to go to grad school at the same time. So I also am a um, case alumna for um, the master's in social work. Um, so I was able to, I knew that I wanted um, to have more exposure to the people who are actually experiencing government programs. I had a lot of the sort of wonky de policy design experience and not as much of the implementation side. Um, so wanted to sort of uh, learn from the social work approach to how, um, how government shows up in people's lives. Um, so I stayed at Mathematica for a couple of years and I will try not to get too um, political on this call because uh, I don't know anybody else's proclivities, but um, then uh, the White House changed hands and I no longer felt like I could um, evaluate government policy. I wanted to be combating bad policies that I felt were coming out of the Trump administration. Um, and so I didn't feel like I could, be, you know, policy design and implementation and evaluation. It's sort of a long continuum. Um, and I was at the very back end evaluating whether things were working. And I was writing reports to Congress and they were maybe reading them or maybe not reading them. Um, so I wanted to be, I decided that I needed to move to the front end of that policy design continuum. Um, so in 2017, I came to the Center for American Progress, which is sort of the big, um, it's not affiliated with the Democratic Party, but it is sort of the establishment liberal um, think tank in DC. Um, a real, it's a big organization for a think tank. It's about um, 300 people, um, research on all sorts of topics from national security to anti-poverty work. Um, and I came uh, to CAP to work on economic mobility. So um, my areas of focus policy-wise were um, raising the minimum wage, expanding unemployment insurance, um, ensuring equal pay regardless of gender, um, and particularly the black-white wealth gap. Um, so working on projects that would, uh, you know, sort of designing new policies to try to accomplish those policy goals, um, but also sort of doing research and as well as doing sort of the legislative campaigning. Um, so working directly with Congress to try to get laws passed. Um, in 2020, um, the world changed and economic policy making changed dramatically. Um, and I stepped into a role for CAP that was more sort of management oriented, trying to coordinate, you know, we've passed, um, we, the federal government has passed about $8 trillion in economic aid over the past year. Um, so I sort of stepped into a role coordinating for the Center for American Progress, our stances on those $8 trillion of relief and stimulus. So trying to figure out, could we get pay, you know, universal paid leave into the next bill? Could we get um, an expansion to unemployment insurance into the next bill and being sort of the coordinating um, person for that on the economic policy side? Um, and then this 
uh, just a couple of months ago took on sort of a more formal management role for the econ policy team. Um, the econ policy team works on issues ranging from, you know, things, you know, labor issues that I work on, like minimum wage, um, to corporate financial regulation, to um, climate, making sure that jobs, green jobs, climate sector jobs are good jobs, they pay well, um, and, uh, you know, sort of all manner of ish taxes, you know, sort of everything you can think of in the econ world is under our umbrella. Um, so that's been really wonderful. And we're in sort of a proactive policymaking world now, um, because we have um, Senate allies and White House allies um, aligned with a lot of our goals. Um, so it's been a really wonderful and busy couple of months <laughs> trying to, you know, make sure that we're communicating, you know, what our priorities are and uh, how we think that the economy can be built into a more sort of a, a just economy that uh, allows everyone to succeed. Um, I will also say that a big part of my journey in DC has been, um, I am, my main extracurricular activity is a choir. Um, there is a uh, 45 voice um, group of singers called the 18th Street Singers. Um, we, in non-pandemic times, <laughs> meet once a month, or sorry, once a week um, to rehearse and perform twice a year. Most of us are in our 20s and 30s, um, and it's a group of people who were pretty serious musicians um, in college and then now generally are, you know, sort of DC regular professionals. Um, but that's been a wonderful home for me um, since coming to DC in 2012. And it's a really important part of, uh, first of all, it's the main thing I'm looking forward to post pandemic. Uh, Cause you can imagine that singing in a room full of 45 people is uh, basically the least safe thing you could have been doing in the past year. Um, but it's also a really important community for me and I'm really looking forward to singing. Uh, so I'm, I'm the managing director of that group, not the conductor, but the person who sort of books the books the shows and um, makes sure everybody comes to rehearsal on time and that they all get snacks because even 30 year old singers need good snacks. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that uh, continuing over the next year. Awesome. Well, and, and it's funny, as you were talking, I just remembered then, even though I hadn't met you in, I think it was 2016. So that would be one of Olivia's classmates. Uh, McKenna Ritter was the Thomas Wolfe scholar. And I was like, I think Lily, Roberts was the Moorhead King. You should reach out to her, and she did, and you were very helpful to her in making her decision. Yeah, we had a I, McKenna's wonderful. We had a, we had a wonderful conversation, and even though we didn't overlap in college, um, we sort of kept tabs in, on each other and uh, kept in contact. Nice, thank you. So, I mean, just as like a follow up question, um, and I'll, I'll and I'll throw this to you, but I think all three of you spoke to it, like um, just a wide range of interests, and and you talked and you know discussed shared about your creative interests. And I was curious, like if you feel like if your career has nurtured those or if that's a part of yourself that you nurture outside of work, if that, does that make sense? Like- Oh, the create creative side of things? Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely a lot of the clients that I work with are creatives. Mm -hmm. um, so either they're, they're, either they, they're doing film or they're doing books or, or they're marketing people who are or advertising people who are coming up with the creative concepts that we have to somehow distill into a brand. Um, so I guess I vicariously work with those people. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, everybody's got a creative side, you know, we definitely, if we like to read one of the pandemic things we've gotten into is my husband reads to me every night. So we pick a book and, and I, I love that, you know, because I remember a, a a uh, friend from HB's father used to read to his mother. I thought that guy that's so Little House on the Prairie, you know, that so we 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 pick a book, mostly their biographies, you know, and yeah. um books that we may not have picked for one another, but it was something together we kind of got through and it was everything from Buzz Bugsy Siegel to uh to uh Andrew Talley to uh um uh I don't know if you know any of these people, he's a big fashion guy. And um there's another great um uh uh, war correspondent book out um, that I highly recommend that I can put in the chat later that we're reading right now. Um, so anyway, it's uh, a woman war, war correspondent. So it, who's like young, like these guys, you know, maybe a little older, um, but cut her teeth when she was in her 20s in Beirut um, and, and Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so 
I, I think that, you know, we do a lack of that kind of stuff, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's mostly, and I, I'm trying to pick up watercolor. I, I've sort of picked that up. I take pictures, uh, you know, I ride a horse, you know, those are sort of my things. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. So this second question, Angela, I'll throw this one to you to start off with. And if you want to tell us about the painting in the background as a bonus, you can feel free. I'm curious about that as well. But um, what is like a significant lesson you have learned from this very strange year 2020? Yeah, so last year I learned about um, both knowing and more importantly, articulating my own value in the career context. Um, as Lily mentioned, um, when you work for government, a lot of the policy direction is set by the administration. And so um, in the case of FERC, that is an independent federal agency, um, FERC doesn't report to like the Secretary of Energy, like it's technically part of the Department of Energy, but it's independent. So there are commissioners and those commissioners are appointed by the president. Um, nonetheless, what happens is that certain values from the administration trickle down. Um, and since the prior administration, you know, I, I think I can say like without just objectively, like President Trump seemed to take great pride in appointing people who had little or no experience. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the people that those appointees would then appoint um, or make, you know, put in leadership positions would similarly have little or no experience. And so in my former role um, and some earlier roles I'd had at FERC, um, occasionally it would become apparent that certain people were making decisions reflecting their lack of experience or their, you know, pure, just like, they're just not qualified for the job. Mm -hmm. um, and so I hope like, and what I'm saying is like well documented in trade press and all that. So it's, you know, not an opinion, it's just a fact. Um, so what I found for me though, was like as, as much as like everyone knew that I had worked in industry before and had developed great expertise, um, I had gotten out of the habit of talking about it. Mm -hmm. I just do my work um, and I, you know, it's fairly senior. so. Some of my work was very much involving other people and directing other people's time, but I didn't necessarily talk about my own leadership. And so I had a couple proceedings that were just really, really difficult to wade through. And I was so frustrated one day and my boss, he and I would like joke all the time because we're similar enough in age and like life experience and all that. So we were laughing and he's just like, hey, Angela, like, you know, if you're this unhappy, you should apply to the Ohio Public Utilities Commission. Like, looks like they need some help. And for those who aren't tracking Ohio energy politics, but like the Ohio PUC is a disaster, like FBI raiding people's homes, like mm -hmm. indictments, it's like all over the news, it's, it's a disaster. So I was so angry in that other proceeding that I was like, you know what, I will, I will apply. And I did. And my name, the Ohio process is, a, is very public, like more public than other states. And I didn't realize that when I first applied, but I, I learned when my name popped up in the news. So like ultimately my name got sent to the governor, to Governor DeWine twice. Yeah. Um, and in meeting with the governor's office, you know, they're asking me like, okay, well, why do you wanna be the chair of the PUC? Why are you, why are you applying? And what I thought about or what I learned sort of during that process was that like, I did not necessarily have much practice in saying why I should lead. I could say, I was in a bunch of roles, like at FERC, I was, you know, an advisor to the chairman. You know, another role I had is advisor to division director. So I had lots of roles where I was like leadership adjacent or leader, you know, a leader in my own right as part of a team but not in a position where I personally was responsible for the entire operation. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned last year was one, knowing my own worth, but also I just started developing skills to talk about it and to explain to other people why I personally should have full responsibility as the leader of an organization. Um, and obviously this is still something I'm thinking about. So, in my new role as like a director level, 
these are the sorts of things that I am um, going to be hopefully careful about considering because mm -hmm. people will be looking at me in the capacity that's different than the capacities I'd had before. Um, so it's a really long way to say that last year I learned it's for myself, it's not simply enough to develop expertise over time. It's also important to be able to talk about it and to be able to communicate that expertise to others in a compelling way. That's fantastic. So I'm in all seriousness, I'm hoping that all three of you at some point can come back to campus as like guest speakers to, to work with the students there. And that what you just said is this perfect example when we get together at these fellowship program directors um, are really kind of bound by a shared sense of value. Like if, if you're in the science research program, it's more about being able to go into a professional lab, see what you have to contribute and, and learn and have a sense of agency than it is about like the science. Most of the students in that program aren't going to go on and be science researchers, but they learn those really valuable. And same thing, even like it's, you might be writing a poem, but it's not really about the poem. It's just like reaching toward you being able to hold forth and, and share your voice with confidence. So that, that was that was really helpful answer. How about you, Lily, for what did the year 2020 teach you? Um, it's been interesting. My focus, because my focus is squarely on economic policy, I really took a strong economic policy lesson from this past year. Um, I had some optimism at the beginning of the pandemic that if anything is ever going to teach people that our fates are linked, it would be an airborne disease. Like it would be a disease that you catch by proximity to people and being in common space, right? Like that affects people regardless of age or, you know, pre-existing conditions. And you would, I had thought that, in, you know, that sort of resulting economic crisis would result in a similar lesson that every, you know, the, the way to prevent economic disaster is to support people at the bottom um, and ensure that nobody's coming into crisis because that's how you sort of boost everyone's votes overall. Um, I think there are some cases in which that lesson did actually bear out, but um, unfortunately, from a sort of policymaking perspective, I think the sort of, there was not a universal experience of this past year. Um, and as a person who focuses on economic inequality, I basically assume that I'm going to spend the rest of my career working on issues that result from the past year um, because there were such vastly different economic experiences of the past year. We're still down 10 million jobs, something like one in five people who were working in March of, or in February of 2020 um, are not working now. Um, even more people than that lost a job over the course of 2020. Their families lost earnings. People had to spend more money on, you know, taking care of their kids at home if childcare was closed um, or uh, trying, you know, they didn't feel safe on public transportation. So they had to arrange other means of transportation. They didn't feel safe at their job because their job wasn't safe. Um, you know, that sort of vastly different experience of the pandemic based on your economic circumstances, the type of job you have, the safety net you have um, in wealth, in family, um, that really will stick with me for a long time um, and is something that I think economic policymaking is going to have to contend with basically for decades. Um, and so while I wish that we had emerged from this year feeling like a really strong sense of common purpose, um, I really worry that existing inequalities were exacerbated over the past year in a way that's going to be really tough to contend with over the next decades. Yeah. I mean, and the, I mean, you add into that the education gap and what some people- Absolutely, have yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, so Ian, I'll throw that same question then to you. What is what is 2020? What, what did I learn in 2020? Um, well, I think I think both uh, Angela and Lily put their finger on a lot of two really big truths that probably became much more apparent this year. One is, and just so you know, Angela, that that thinking that it's difficult to articulate your worth, it never changes. Okay, it's just I hate to break it to you, but it's not just because you're young and inexperienced. 
I, it, you always, if you're pushing yourself and challenging yourself, you have to keep reinventing yourself, right? And I think this was the year of reinvention um, for a lot of people to survive. They had to somehow articulate their vision in a new way. Um, and so, uh, you know, what Lily said is absolutely right. You know, the beginning of the year, last year, I was actually sitting in the office with Doug Emhoff, the second gentleman, who's a good friend because he's my law partner. He was my law partner. And um, and we, we were looking at our phones and just catching up. And this was before um, Kamala got put in the VP role. He was, you know, she had just dropped out of the race and we were just hanging out talking. And all of a sudden we got a text on our phone saying, someone on your floor has coronavirus, you have to evacuate. And that was the last time he had seen me and I had seen him in person and he had been at the firm and then everything changed, right? She became v VP and he became second gentleman and um, you know the whole world changes. He has to reinvent himself as a law professor. I mean, it never really ends. I thought the whole law practice was gonna fold because I thought business was gonna be crazy, but everybody seemed, you know, at, at, at certain levels uh, to reinvent themselves. And the unfortunate problem is that we have an unequal playing field for a lot of people who couldn't reinvent themselves. And that has to change. So I'm just very proud that Lily's doing something to change that. And Angela's doing something on the green energy, all this important stuff that could not be more important. Um, what I learned is about it, something, I, a, a word that sounds like a buzzword, but it's like my new word, it's intentionality. Um, I, I started reading uh, The Daily Stoic, which I don't know if you guys read The Daily Stoic, but it's an Instagram meme that basically talks about the Stoics and, 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 and you know, Seneca and all these people who basically talked about, you know, being intentional in your life and not just reacting to things. And um, so one of the, I'm going to sort of preempt um, one of your other questions that we're probably going to run out of time and I'll just throw it out there that what, what I, I had a mentorship meeting with a, a young lawyer or who is, sits on a board with me, a nonprofit board for women and, and girls in the District of Columbia. And I'm helping her sort of figure out her next step. She wants to be a CEO of some company or she's now a business consultant for Deloitte. And so I said, um, okay, she, you know, and so she said, what can I do for you? And I never, it's like, what can you do for me? You know, you're, you're much younger than I am and I, I, you can't do it. I mean, whatever. And she said, actually, what do you want to do? And your what's your next challenge? And I said, I want to sit on a, on a private company board uh, or a public company board, not a nonprofit, a for-profit company board, because there are a lot of really interesting issues coming into those boards right now, as you can see in Georgia and elsewhere. And so I, I, I was very curious about that. And she put, she immediately nominated me and I got on a Deloitte board readiness uh, program that basically places people on boards. They have to rewrite your board. I sent you my board um, bio, which I didn't know anything about doing, but now I know how to do it. And Facing that new challenge was I had to articulate, Angela, to this group today when we did our workshop, what's your elevator speech? What are you going to bring to a board? And, you know, here I am, 60, whatever it is, <laughs> coming up with what I, what's my addition to the board? You know, what's my value to this board? And so that question never changes. If you're really pushing yourself, you're going to be asking that question and pushing yourself no matter where you are in your life. Thank you. Well. Um... Dana, I, like I could literally do this all night long and mentorship was one of my favorite topics too, but I think I better throw this back to you since we're, we're at past eight o'clock now. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, these are just phenomenal, phenomenal um, questions. I'm sorry, I'm removing spotlight here. Uh, phenomenal answers, phenomenal thought process. I love the the intentionality and all of the different things that um, you all shared. Um, Scott, why don't we, why don't you toss it out for sort of a closing statement, comment, and give everybody an opportunity to share one final thing. And then uh, again, we will be following up with sending you uh, a directory of all the folks that are in the DC area, but we also have an opportunity or have a way for you to find, meet other alums in terms of if you see somebody on the call, if you were in, in the very brief breakout room with someone who you want to stay in touch with, we do have an alum directory. Um, you can always reach out to me and we can make sure to connect you if you didn't already um, share that information. You can also use the chat feature this evening to, to exchange information. But Scott, I'll toss it back to you if you, you want a, one final wrap up question, thought. All right, well, I'll throw, I'll throw it to the group as like, um, 
to end on a positive note to follow through on some of the topics that just got brought up is just if you're looking ahead at 2021, a personal or professional goal you have set for yourself in the year ahead. And I'll let Angela, since you're starting a new job, I'll throw that one to you. Uh, okay. Yeah. I really like what Ann said about intentionality. Um, my hope is to be able to carry um, the prioritization of values that I was able to kind of focus on last year or during the, the stay at home time into the future. So I'm hopeful that I won't, or at least I'd like to um, not be so distracted by things that aren't as important and rather be intentional about dedicating time to the people and to the pursuits that um, I value. I, I'm going with that one too. That's a good, That's good. transformational kind of goal. Um, how about Ann, do you wanna take that same question? Yeah, I mean, just follow piggybacking on that. There's no, to me, that's like huge. That's a huge one if, if we really want to do what we want to do in life. And I've started meditating, which I, I kind of did before, but never really spent much time on it. And one of the things you do in meditation is you set an intention, right? You're trying to figure out what is the purpose for your meditation right now? Is it, you know, for me, I, I bought, I'm, I'm so cliche during the, the thing, I got a Peloton, right? So it's it's a little daunting to get this this bicycle is in Pain. And the people who do this, like literally you, you, you kill yourself on this thing. So you have to set an intention that you're going to get on there and kick it, you know what, for like 45 minutes with this buff guy from London. And, 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 and honestly, it was fabulous. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, it, it, there's something about imaging. And I remember doing this when I was a young lawyer in a square peg in a round hole, a woman lawyer in the 1980s was, a, was, a, was a big breakthrough. So it was very similar to what you guys must feel in some ways, um, imaging myself actually going through these motions so that by the time I did it, it was in my head and it was sort of, I was in the zone just doing it. I wouldn't have to think about it, right? So to me, it's like skiing or playing tennis, anything you wanna really accomplish, if you can sort of image yourself or in, see yourself intentionally going through it, it really helps you, believe it or not, it's, it's like a mind trick, but it kind of works. Um, actually do it um you know with a reason you're not going to fly off a building but you can certainly do things that you're trained to do um and that you know you have the intelligence to do and certainly with with hb and and these incredible people we have here uh, that gives you that foundation to be able to really be have great judgment and uh and great analytical ability so um that's that's what i i want to keep meditating and and helping myself image through the kinds of things i want to accomplish including this board service nice i i was like literally kind of ready for bed at 6 30 tonight but now i feel energized and <laughs> ready to live my best life right now so right is, exactly all right how about lily you can you want to bring it home for us yeah so um i think my goal you know i sort of alluded to how important um being in a musical community is, is for me in addition to my work. And I, you know, it's interesting. I really believe in the impact of, of my work and it's really important to me. And it's the thing I'm thinking about 90% of the time, but it's a little hard sometimes to keep the finish line in mind. Like someday 42 million people will get a raise when we increase the minimum wage. I will have played a very small part in that for 42 million people, a very, very, very small part in that. And it could be years from now. In the short term, I try to find ways to impact my community in positive ways. And for me, um, being in a choir is a really big part of that. I'm able to bring musical experiences and, and joy to, to audiences by sort of facilitating choral performances. I'm able to bring a musical home to my friends who are singers. Um, and that's really something that I've missed over the past year is having that sense of um, being of service to a small community, um, in addition to sort of this big abstract millions of people, masses of, of folks who um, are impacted by economic policy work. Um, so my goal for the next year is to really relish uh, all the moments when I can feel connected to that small in-person community that I value so much. Nice, awesome, that's great. Um, well, Dana, I think I'll throw it back to you. I know we have like, so we have two, Olivia, and I think I just saw Evie on this call too, two young, some recent college grads headed to DC and Audra, I saw you on there in college in DC. And so hopefully you get to connect and see these people. Um, but thank you all for your time tonight. It was terrific to hear your stories. And Dana, I'll throw it back to you. 
Sure, yes, thank you so, so much. Uh, Fran, would you like to uh, have any final comments as we head out for the evening? You know, just a deep thanks. And uh, I think women rising boldly, inspiring women to rise boldly. I, I, I do think your mentorship and how you um, so fully speak as you've done tonight to young women, they all, they just eat up every word as I did, but thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for being here. And uh, I, I think one of the things I always um, want to do is to have that, uh, have a, a younger woman, to be that champion for women, the, especially the younger women. And uh, it just sounds like on your journeys, you've done that and, and uh, continue to do so. So thank you.